voice is a little, and eh, whatever. It is what it is. Let's all stand this morning and let's pray, shall we? Begin our service. I am, I am on. I'm plugged. I'm on. I'm on. I think I'm on. Thank you. I leave that to other people. I just stand here. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've made. Father, we glorify in your presence this morning. And we give you glory, O Holy One. Father, I ask that you put upon us this morning a uh, garment of praise this morning for a spirit of heaviness, Father God. Father, we know that you love us and we love you, Father, with all of our hearts. So this morning we ask that you open our ears that we would hear what you'd have us to hear. Open our hearts that we would receive what you'd have us to receive. We invite you, Holy Spirit, and we welcome you in this place this morning. We give you glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. There's a lot of new faces in my, in my perspective here this morning. So if you could just turn around a couple of people and just say, hey, welcome to GCC.
good this morning? Amen. Hey, we're going to sing that chorus again back there. Let's sing it together. Uh, we worship you. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you. For you are. Come on, lift your voice, sing it. We worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship you, for you are, for you are, for you are, you are good. Sounds good this morning, sounds good. Water you turn into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you There's none like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the darkness you rise There's no one like you There's none like you I got a stronger, I got a stronger, God, you are higher than any other. I got a stealer, awesome in power, our God, our God. I got a stronger, I got a stronger, God, you are higher than any other. I got a stealer, awesome in power, our God. God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, what can stand against? And if our God is for us, who could ever stop us? If our God is with us, what can stand against? What can stand against? Our God is greater. I got it stronger, got you were higher than any other. I got it stronger, awesome in power, my God, my God. I got it stronger, I got it stronger, got you were higher than. serve an awesome and powerful God. Amen? Amen. You may be seated for a minute. <clears throat> so, good morning again. Good morning. So fantastic to be with all of you this morning and for you to be here with us as well. Welcome to GCC. We appreciate it. In the front of your seats, if this is your first time being here, we'd love to connect with you. There's a blue card. Fill that information out for us. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Fill that information out for us. Let us uh, connect with you as you connect with us. If you have a prayer request as well, back of that card, you can fill that out and just let us join with you in prayer and believing on whatever the need is. These cards go in the box out in the foyer, <clears throat> and that box in the foyer is also for our tithes and offerings. <clears throat> so if you came prepared this morning for a, to, uh, for with your tithes and offerings, please feel free on the way out to drop it in the box. If you prefer, you can also go to the GCC app and give there, or you can go to the church's website, which is gardener.church slash giving. If you prefer to mail, like those of you who are online, by the way, good morning, welcome you, everyone online as well, uh, you can send it to the address that's there on your screen. All right, amen. Let's pray over the offering, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we do have the opportunity to give into your house, Holy One. Father God, it's such an honor to help to supply the needs of this church because this church, Father God, you have blessed to touch many places in the entire world. What an honor. We thank you for it, Father. And Father, for those who do not have the ability to give, 
Father, we speak a special blessing over the, their lives as well, that you would supply all their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus, your Son, that they too can have that blessing of giving into your house. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, uh, Amen. Let's stand up and sing one more song before uh, Pastor Caleb comes, shall we? Good morning. 
A reading from the book of Matthew 11, 28 through 12, 14. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you had a sheep and it falls into the pit of the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees ran out and plotted how they were going to kill Jesus. Thank you so much, Renee, for reading God's Word this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be in the house with you this morning, and a good morning to our online church as well. It's fantastic to have you with us here. Well, as we look to God's Word, let us come and pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of being in your house this morning. We thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being able to have your word, your very word spoken to mankind. And Lord, we just pray this morning, Holy Spirit, that you would fall afresh on us, that you would fall in your power. Lord, that you would anoint us this morning, that we may know your presence, your power, your blessing with us. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth, And I pray that the meditations of each of our hearts, Lord, would be pleasing in your sight. Lord, you are our rock. You are our redeemer, as the psalmist says. And we come seeking you. We come asking for your help this morning. Bless us at this time, we pray, for we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I want you to imagine Jesus' disciples on this particular Sabbath day. Here they are, they're strolling through the grain fields, and, and it, maybe it's a hot day. They're really hungry, right? And so what do they do? They go past, they can't help themselves. There's, there's lots of good grain there. They take some of the kernels of wheat and they begin to eat it. They're not trespassing. They're not stealing, according to, according to the law. If we look at these words in Deuteronomy 23, verse 25, it says, If you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, for you must not put, but you must not put a sickle to their standing grain. So fair enough, right? They're not to harvest the, the grain, but they're allowed to just, just pick a few kernels of grain and eat it. They're not trespassing, according to the law. They're not stealing, according to the law. So we might ask, well, what is the Pharisees' problem? Right? Why are they so mean? Right? Why are they condemning here? Why are they being so judgmental? As the Pharisees see it, the disciples are working on the Sabbath by picking that grain. I know that's hard to believe for us to get our heads around, but this is the psyche of the Pharisees. And this is what they say to Jesus, verse 2. They say, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. So we're going to break this down a little bit in just a second. But now we move on to the second narrative in our passage this morning. And we see that it's the same Sabbath. Jesus goes into the synagogue, right? And he sees this man with a shriveled up hand. 
Can you imagine the plight of this man? Can you imagine the daily pain, the daily struggle, the daily frustrations that this man endures? A couple of years ago, my, my fingertips went completely numb, and then I had to have carpal tunnel surgery on both of them. Well, I promise you, while they were still numb, I mean, it was an incredible hindrance. When I tried typing on the keyboard, when I tried playing on the piano, whatever it was, I felt nothing. Right, And I mean, this was just a minor hindrance in comparison to what this man must have gone through. Think about the, the pain, the struggle. Think about uh, even perhaps the social stigma. On top of that, what kind of work could he do with one hand that worked? Probably not a lot of different work. And so Jesus comes into the synagogue. He sees this man with the shriveled up hand, and he has great compassion on him. So what does he do? What Jesus does, what Jesus does, doesn't he? Right, And he heals him. Uh, and we see in our passage this morning, verse 30, and it says, His hand was completely restored, just as sound as the other. It wasn't a partial healing kind of gig here, right? This was full healing. He was completely restored, right? One hand just as sound as the other. And then the healing of God is just amazing when it happens, isn't it, right? Last, as I said last week, we plan to do a preaching series here on healing uh, after Easter, and I'm looking forward to that. But I encourage us, friends, uh, that we look to God. We look to God in His healing. Does God always heal? No healing in this lifetime does not always happen, but we still pray for it, don't we? Right? We still intercede. We still look to God on behalf of ourselves, on behalf of our family, on behalf of our church family, and even beyond that. We pray to our God who is a healing God. But back to our passage this morning, we see we have this man with a shriveled up hand. His hand is restored. But I would offer there was something else in our passage this morning that was shriveled up that is not restored. And what is that? That is the hearts of all of the Pharisees. They have these shriveled up hearts, right? They, they are cold, they are callous, they are uncaring. They don't care that this man has a shriveled up hand. They don't care that he possibly can't work. They don't care about his daily frustrations, his struggles, his pain. They don't care possibly about the social stigma that he has to endure. They just don't care. Their hearts are indifferent. And more than that, they're looking for any excuse to accuse Jesus, to condemn him. And we get to the end of our passage this morning where Jesus does heal this man. And what is their approach here? What, is, what are their thoughts? Verse 14 says this, But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Jesus who heals a man. And what do these guys do? They try to find a way to kill him. Right? This is where they're at. And of course, it's always a good reminder for us to examine our own hearts because I don't know about you, but I know my own heart. Right? And it's very easy for my heart to shrivel up without God's grace. Right? It's, very hard, it's very easy for me to become cold and, and indifferent, to, to lack the care and the compassion that I should have from, for my neighbor as myself. And so we pray, Lord, would you search my heart? Lord, would you show me my heart? Lord, would you show me where my heart is cold, where it is callous, where it is unfeeling, where it is indifferent to the plight of someone, my neighbor next to me? Right? So we pray to the Lord. If we go to Mark's account of this narrative, in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, here it says, Jesus looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Right? Right here we see God is not pleased. And more than that, that we, in fact, we see that he is deeply distressed when he sees our cold and our indifferent hearts. And so we pray, Lord, would you soften my heart? Right? Just be honest. I mean, sometimes we have cold, unfeeling hearts. Lord, my heart is shriveled. My heart is cold. Would you soften my heart? But friends, as we consider this, this passage this morning, we, with these two different narratives, where both of them happen on the Sabbath, with the disciples walking through the grain fields and picking heads of grain, we see Jesus also the same Sabbath healing this man, right? And, and it's good for us to get a better understanding of what the Sabbath is all about. What is this idea of Sabbath? Does it mean that we have to worship on a Saturday, as some, some denominations do? No, I don't believe that is what Jesus is saying here. In fact, if we look at the Gentile church later, on, we see they broke bread on the first day of the week, right? Yes, this was a custom for, for the Jewish people uh, to worship on the Sabbath, um, but uh, the broader application for, for the, the New Testament church, we see uh, just a couple of references, Acts 20 and 7, 1 Corinthians 16 and 2, we see there, we see the New Testament church meeting on the first day of the week, breaking bread, uh, bringing uh, offerings on, on the first day of the week. So we see that this pattern is established with the New Testament 
Testament church. So I'm not going to be talking or debating about which day we worship today, right? Some people believe we should worship on the, on the Sabbath being the seventh day. That's not where I'm going today, right? Some people believe, no, it's Sunday. I think we can worship and we should be worshiping God each and every day, right? Bringing our, our lives as a daily offering to God as we're told in Romans chapter 12. This is not where we're going today. What I want to do is give us a broader understanding and application of this idea of Sabbath, even for us as Christians today. What does it mean, right? What does it mean? If we take a look at the approach of the Pharisees, you might say they were hyper-legalistic. There was a lot of do's and a lot of don'ts there, right? And a lot of it was not according to the law of God. It was according to their own man-made up laws, right? You shall do this, you shall not do that, right? And for some of us, we may tend to go to that kind of, that, that side of the spectrum. What it might be a little bit more of a legalistic thing. We might have a whole bunch of do's and don'ts. We may prescribe those to other people. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. But then if we go to the other side of the spectrum, we have something called permissive license, where the Sabbath is just anything, right? Anything goes, right? Sunday or worship, well, we maybe we'll do it, maybe we won't do it, right? Whatever happens, right? It's just another day. But what does the Bible have to say if we were to take this idea of, of, of a Sabbath and even apply it to us as, as New Covenant, New Testament Christians? Let's go to our passage this morning in verse 8. This is what Jesus says here. He says, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus is talking about himself here, right? He is the Son of Man. He's the Son of God and the Son of Man. Right? He is, as he says here, the Lord of the Sabbath. Last week, we took a look at this idea of God being the Lord of the harvest. This week, we see God, Jesus, is the Lord of the Sabbath. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be Lord of the Sabbath? Well, I believe we need to go back all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 1, we see God creating the heavens and the earth. We see God creating day and night. We see God creating seven days, including the seventh day, right? We see that if you go, for example, Genesis 1, verses 3 to 5, verses 14 to, 6, 14 to 19, you see there God creating the seven days. We flip over to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2. This is what we read here uh, as it talks about God as the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, verse, verse 2 here, Genesis 2 and 2. It says, By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So there we see quite a few things, don't we? Firstly, we've already established in Genesis chapter 1 that God creates. Right? God creates the seventh day. But then in, in, in chapter 2, we see he not only creates the seventh day, but he institutes it as a Sabbath. So it's set apart. Secondly, he rests from all of his work. You see that there in verses 2 and 3. Thirdly, we see that he blesses the Sabbath, right? The Sabbath is now blessed as a, as, a, as a day set apart for God, and he makes it holy. It is consecrated. It is set apart for God. We see that in just these two verses in Genesis chapter 2. And God reiterates this idea, this whole, this idea of this, this holy day uh, if we go to the Ten Commandments, right? Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. God says this to his people. He says, remember the Sabbath day. And I think that's important, right? Even for us today, remember. Do we remember the Sabbath day? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And we could just unpack just that idea there in a, in a whole sermon, but we're not going to do that this morning. Right, Kevin had us singing, let my words be few, so I'll try to do that this morning. <laughs> uh, but let's go to number five, right, in keeping with this idea, we also see that the, the Sabbath is uh, a, a day for worship. Right, a day for worship. And we see this even with Jesus' example, right? He, he would attend the, the synagogue on the, on the Sabbath. That's what he was doing in our narrative this morning, right? The word uh, synagogue in the Greek means assembly, right? This assembly of people. It replaces the Hebrew word, which means congregation, right? And so it was this uh, coming to the synagogue. We see Jesus doing, and he does that on the, on the Sabbath. For example, if we go to Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it says he went to Nazareth, 
where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Right? It was his custom to go into the synagogue. What did he do at the synagogue? Well, we see him preaching and teaching in the synagogue. Uh, the synagogue was a place of prayer. The synagogue was also a place of worship. And so we see here on the Sabbath, as was his custom, Jesus goes into the synagogue. So here we see five different things as we take a look at this idea of God being the Lord of the Sabbath. He creates the seventh day and institutes it as a Sabbath. Right? He rests from all of his work. He blesses the Sabbath. He makes it holy, consecrated, set apart, and it's also to be set aside as a day of worship unto God. So we have this idea, right? Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made by God and for him. But did you know that the Sabbath was also made for mankind? Right? The Sabbath is also intended to be a blessing unto mankind. And we, if we take a look at back at Mark's account of the same narrative that we have this morning, right? this is what Jesus says to the Pharisees there, Mark 2 and 27. He says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Right? The Pharisees are back to front. Right? They've become so legalistic. In their minds, mankind was meant to serve the Sabbath with a lot of do's and a lot of don'ts. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. You can't even pick a grain of uh, a head of grain and eat it on the Sabbath as far as they were concerned. They were in this hyper-legalistic place. Thou shalt not. Right? But Jesus is saying, hey, you've got it wrong. You've got it back to front. The Sabbath is made as a gift. It was made to serve mankind, not the other way around. It was made as a gift, as a blessing unto mankind. And so we might wonder, well, then just how is, a man, how is the Sabbath made as a blessing, as a gift for mankind? Well, let's go back again to God's original design, right? Back to Genesis chapter 2 again. Let me read those verses one more time. Verse 2. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, what did he do? He rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, what did he do? He rested from all the work of creation that he had done. Right? You know, I think there's a lot of good passion in God's original design. Right? God creates and as a pattern, I believe, if we as, as humanity follow this, this pattern from, from his original creation, if we follow this pattern, this blueprint, you might even argue, if we, were to, if we are to follow that, we as humanity will prosper. Right in chapter 2, for example, uh, God says there to, to Adam and Eve to take care of the garden, to look after it, to care for the earth. When we care for the earth, we prosper, don't we? We want clean land, we want clean air, we want clean water, not only for ourselves, but for our kids and for our grandkids. When we look after the earth, we are blessed, we flourish, right? And here also we see, in the, in the, just in these two verses here, another what I would offer is part of God's a wider blueprint for humanity, and that is rest. We need rest, Right? On the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Verse 3, uh, he made it holy because on it he rested from all the work. So God, we see, works uh, six days, and I believe those were literal days. Six literal days he worked, and then on the seventh literal day, he rests. And of course, he's showing us a pattern, isn't he? He's showing us an example for us to follow, that we as humanity work six days, and on the seventh day, we rest, right? And how much rest we need, don't we? Right? Who doesn't need rest? We need rest at multiple levels. Our bodies need rest from labor. Our minds need rest from cognitive work, right? Uh, on, on, I take my Sabbath, quote, unquote, uh, on a Tuesday. Many of you know that, right? And so don't be frustrated if I don't respond to you on a Tuesday if you send me a text or, or something else. If, you, if it's an emergency, I will respond. I promise that. Right? But if it's just, hey, how you doing, or can you do this or that, I might reply to you on early on Wednesday instead. Because for me, it is a break. It, for me, it is my, quote, Sabbath. Right? And I take that seriously. I, like all of you, need rest. Right? And I'm not going to shy away from, from that. Uh, so don't be offended if I don't uh, rep respond to you on, quote, my Sabbath at the Tuesday. Right? I need that cognitive break. 
right? I need that rest. Uh, all of us need rest at different levels. Our emotions need rest even from the term. I think about all the things that hit us throughout the week that cause all kinds of stress and worry and, and care and concern. Can you imagine taking a day as, as I mean, what, what that vogue word these days is, I'm taking a mental health day, right? <laughs> but we need that. At that emotional level, we need to take a break. We need to have that rest. At that emotional level, that mental level, that physical level, whatever it is, we need to rest. And what a difference it makes when we truly take a day to rest. You know, when I was at seminary, I remember one of my professors, uh, and he was talking to us about this idea of rest, and he was talking about two of his former students, and apparently they had become really obnoxious in the seminary. Like, they were just a stench throughout the, the seminary. They were just so, so, so annoying, so obnoxious. And this got to the attention of the dean of the school, and the dean called these two guys in and just tried to say, hey, what's going on here? And he found out that they simply lacked rest. They just needed a good night's sleep, and they just needed some rest because they were studying so hard, right? They just needed to just take a day or two off. So he sends them home and tells them to take a break for a couple of days. No, no, no assignments, no, no paper writing, no nothing. Just get some rest, get some sleep. And apparently it was like a miracle in the seminary, right? They came back and the seminary was just a whole much better place to be because these two students were in a much better place, right? Um, but we need rest, right? Others around us need rest. And we even see that coming back to the Ten Commandments again. Um, Ten Commandments we might just see as a bunch of rules, but in them, God, we see the first four commandments are, 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 are all unto God, but the rest of them are all unto humanity, that humanity may flourish, Right, so let's take a look at Exodus chapter 20 from verse 9. That's what God says here. He says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Right, it's to, to God who is the Lord of the Sabbath. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male and female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your, ha in your towns. Why? Well, God ties it back to creation, doesn't he? Let's go to verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested. On the seventh day, right? He rested on the seventh day. So from the beginning of time as we know it, right, God creates all things, including a seventh day of rest. God is showing us by example that we all need to rest. And notice not only us, but everybody that's in our care as well, everybody around us. We see that, verse 10 again. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. I mean, that pretty much covers everybody, doesn't it? Right? It covers everyone. You yourself are to rest. Your children are to rest. Right? We give Abby Sunday off. Chores. <laughs> we, we believe in two things. We need to teach her the ethic of work. Right? There's just, the, this day and age, there is not an ethic of work uh, being taught. And so we want her to know the ethic of work. Right? So she has chores. Uh, but she has those chores uh, Monday through to Saturday. But on Sunday, she doesn't have to do chores. And doesn't she remind us? <laughs> Right? I don't have to do chores today. So she loves Sunday. Not only she, she loves church, she really does, but she also loves it because she doesn't have to do chores. And I mean, we, we just picked that up. We just, just decided that was just what we were going to do. But then as I was exploring this passage, I'm like, wow, that's in the Ten Commandments. You know that? Wow, it's in the Ten Commandments. Right, so your children are to rest. Any workers you have are to rest. Your animals are even to rest. Of course, here it's talking about working animals, the donkeys, the colts, the, the horses. I mean, if we were to look at our animals, our cat and our dog, they have this permanent rest thing going. Right, <laughs> Chester and Sparky, they have it pretty good. They've got it made. They've got this, this eternal Sabbath thing happening. Right, uh, even the foreigners in your town, God says, are to rest. And if you, can you imagine... If this were to happen for everybody at the same time, here I'm not talking about emergency personnel. We need them to carry on. We need uh, with a certain, uh, certain uh, populations, demographics that need to continue working. But outside of that, can you imagine the general population taking a day break every week? Can you imagine what a more healthy society we would have? Can you imagine we would be mentally, uh, emotionally, physically just so much more healthy as a people? And of course, we can't mandate anything like that. But just imagine if this was this voluntary thing, how incredible that would be. 
Brad, I've spoken before about uh, when we used to live in Illinois, and, and we used to love going down to Shipshawana in, in Indiana. And of course, Vicki Redmond, that's your, your neck of the woods. Uh, but this is a fantastic little town. We, 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 we just, it's a couple of hours away from where we used to live, and we'd just go and hang out there. I mean, this is, look at how small Abbey is there. It's incredible. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, just, just this quaint old world town. It was an Amish town. It was very much a touristy kind of town. They had the best donuts. Thank you again, Keith and Kathy, for bringing. You know, they brought donuts back to me from, from this little town uh, all the way back here to Washington. I will be forever in your debt. But, I mean, just, just beautiful town. I mean, everywhere you go, you see scripture inscribed on the walls of buildings. There was this barn, I remember, which had the Ten Commandments on it. They had uh, what I call Hobby Lobby music going in, in pretty much every restaurant and every shop. You know what I mean by, by Hobby Lobby music, right? All that instrumental hymns and instrumental uh, choruses, uh, Christian choruses. Everywhere you went, it, it was just a nice town. But something else that uh, inspired me about this town was on Sunday, everything just shut down. Everybody rested, everybody went to church, except for the local gas station, right? Uh, but uh, the first time, it kind of caught us unawares, right? No, there were no restaurants open on, on the Sunday, and there was a gas station, but everybody just went to church. We very rested and went to church. And as I think about that, outside of any legalism, I don't know if that was there or not, but outside of that, I think, what a blessing that was for this whole town, what a blessing it was that everybody had an opportunity together to rest. Everybody had an opportunity to go and worship God. What an incredible blessing for this, for all the workers of that town, that they could just shut down, they could just rest, they could just reset one day a week, and they get to do it together. Uh, so so I, 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 I just love that town, I really do. But as we, as we consider this idea of rest this morning, I think it's a wonderful idea. I even would argue it's crucial for us to have a day set aside to rest, to recharge, to reset. But did you know that we can rest not just even once a week, but every day? In fact, at any given moment, you and I can rest. How do we do that? Well, in our passage this morning, right, we've got two narratives of the Sabbath. The first where we've got the, the disciples walking through these grain fields on the Sabbath. And the second is where Jesus is healing on the Sabbath. But just prior to that... Jesus himself talks about rest, and this is what he says. This is a beautiful invitation, verse 28. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Right. So yes, we can find a physical, mental, emotional rest as we set aside physically one day a week as we designate that to be a Sabbath. But on top of that, any and every day at any given moment, we can come into the presence of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who gives us this, this incredible invitation, come unto me and I will give you rest. Right? Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, right? Christ is with us. His presence is with us. And we can just come and rest in His embrace. Know that we're in His presence. Maybe take some deep breaths and say, Jesus, I've got so many burdens right now. Jesus, I'm going to trust in You. Jesus, I'm going to give these burdens to You. Jesus, I'm going to rest in You, right? And that's available to us at any given moment, right? On any given day. We don't have to wait for a, a physical Sabbath day for that. We can do that at any time. And yet here we are hurried and harried, right? We rushed through the, the, through the days of the week like little ants on a mission, right? And, and, and Jesus has this universal invitation, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, right? I said, come, hurried and harried ones. Let us take some deep breaths and just rest in the embrace of our Savior. Right? We don't have to wait for that physical Sabbath to have rest. Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, is our one true Sabbath rest. Right? As he is our spiritual Sabbath, you might say, and we can rest in him anytime we like. So as we look at this idea of the Sabbath and how it, is, uh, unto, uh, how it is designed to serve mankind and bless mankind, we see especially it is given as a gift of rest to mankind, and we need that gift. Secondly, though, we see something else in our second narrative this morning. What do we see there? Jesus goes into the synagogue, right? And he does good. 
it is lawful, as he says, to do good on the Sabbath, right? And so when, as a, it is a gift unto mankind to do good for each other. Jesus sees this man with a shriveled up hand, and he brings healing to him on the Sabbath. And of course, you can imagine the Pharisees at this point, they are inwardly fuming, or even outwardly as well, right? They're inwardly having this little temper tantrum. They're furious with Jesus for what he's doing on the Sabbath. And this is what Jesus says to them, verse 11 of our passage. He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? So they were being huge hypocrites, weren't they? Right? They wouldn't hesitate to rescue any one of their own animals. Jesus says that, and then he says, verse 12, how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful, he says, to do what? To do good on the Sabbath. And friends, I would offer that the same is true for us. Yes, the Sabbath is, is a day of rest, but where you see a need, don't hesitate to go and do good on the Sabbath. Now, I'm not saying you need to be an energizer bunny on, on, the, on the Sabbath and, and look to every charity and see how you can, uh, you can tick every charity box and, and do every good that you can on the, on the Sabbath. That's not what the intent of what Jesus is saying here. Uh, have your rest. The Sabbath is, is a day of rest. But if you see a need at the same time, right, don't say, well, I'm on my Sabbath today, so I can't do that, right? No, if you see a real need, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And I'm sure I've quoted my dad's example here before, but uh, I admired his take on the Sabbath. Okay, sometimes I thought he was a little bit legalistic. But at the same time, my dad, when it came to the Sabbath, he was a farmer, and uh, on, on a Sunday to him, Sunday was his Sabbath, and for him, Sunday was a day of two things, rest and worship. Now, as a farmer, as you know, the farm doesn't stop going on a Sunday, right? But what he would do on the Saturday, he would plan and prepare as much as he could so that he had very minimal work to do on the Sunday. Yes, occasionally there might be cows to feed, to, to be given hay in the winter. Rather, right? cows still need to be milked. That was often my job. And, uh, but outside of that, most of the stock was shifted on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the Saturday in, in a field big enough that could, uh, they could handle for two days. Right? And he would do anything and everything he did uh, could do on the Saturday in preparation for Sunday so that he had very minimal work to do on the Sunday. But then we had a neighbor uh, who, who was a Catholic guy, and he didn't have the same convictions as my dad. Right? He didn't have the same convictions, and so he, every day was the same as far as he was con concerned. And one Sunday, one, one hot summer day, he was out making hay, baling hay in, in, in his field uh, one Sunday afternoon. And then... True to form the west coast of New Zealand, the heavens just opened and burst with rain. And my dad, seeing this, he gets into his truck as soon as he can, and he heads on over to our neighbor, and he helps him to get that hay in so that not too much of it gets wet. And I admire that balance there, right? For him, he prepared as much as he could so that he would rest and worship on, the, on his Sabbath. But at the same time, he would not hesitate to do good on the Sabbath if it was going to help his neighbor get his hay into the barn before it rained too much, right? So there is a balance there, a wonderful balance there. But what a blessing the Sabbath really is to mankind, right? Firstly, we see God is the Lord of the Sabbath, right? He creates the seventh day. He institutes it as a Sabbath to be observed. He rests from all of his work. He blesses the Sabbath. He makes it holy, consecrated, set apart. And as we see even with Jesus' own example, the Sabbath is to be set aside as a day of worship to God. And as I mentioned, I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of whether we should worship on a Saturday or a Sunday or any other day. Right? Non-denominational non big mega churches have seem to have services throughout the week even now. Right? And we see the New Testament example shows... Uh, Christian believers, Gentiles especially, worshiping on the, on the Sunday, breaking bread, bringing the offerings on the Sunday. Uh, but the broader application we see here, we have God who is the Lord of the Sabbath, right? We have this day that is holy unto Him, consecrated, blessed by Him, but we also see that the Sabbath is made for mankind, right? As Jesus says back to Mark chapter 2, 27, he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And how is it made for mankind? At least in two ways. One, that we might get that good old-fashioned rest we need, right? Body, soul, and spirit, right? We need that rest. Uh, but secondly, the Sabbath is also made for mankind to do good, 
right? As I said, we don't run around like trying to, 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 trying to, to attend to every charity that there is. That's not what it means. But if you see a need, right, go and help that person. It is lawful, as Jesus says, to do good on the Sabbath. Well, of course, as we've already seen as well, ultimately, Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, is also a true spiritual Sabbath, isn't he? He is our one, and tr- one, one rest, and we can come to him and find rest in him at any time. So I want to finish off with those words of Jesus again. As, as I do, right, I know that we've got a lot going on in this church. There's a lot of burdens, a lot of stresses, a lot of worries, a lot of cares and concerns going on in here. And I encourage you, as, as I read these words, right, feel free to, to close your eyes, feel free to, to take some deep breaths, and just receive this invitation that Jesus gives here. Just receive it afresh this morning. If you have burdens, trust in him to, to, to lay those down at his feet. Trust him to take care of them. It's tempting to take them back, isn't it? Jesus, I give this to you, but hang on, I'm going to take it back again. Right? Trust him. Right? He knows best what to do with your burdens. Right? So let me just, uh, just feel free to, to close your eyes. Uh, Take some deep breaths, and just as I read these words of Christ, just receive it as an invitation from him to you this morning. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. So spend a few moments in the presence of Jesus. He is here with us. Rest in him. Trust in him. Lay your burdens at his feet this morning. Perhaps some of us need to hear this a second time as we lay those burdens down. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's just spend a few more moments in the presence of Jesus. Don't be afraid to lay down those burdens and trust in him if you're still holding on to them this morning. Christ is our true rest. Christ is the one who truly can take our burdens and... and And do whatever is necessary. Trust in him. Give them over to him this morning. Lord, we come to you and we receive this invitation of yours to come unto you. Lord, there's so much in this life that causes us to be weary and burdened, but Lord, you give us this universal invitation that you will give us rest. Lord, and we just fall and we just collapse into your arms this morning. Some of us come weary and exhausted. Some of us have great burdens, great worries, great stresses, great cares and concerns. And we give those over to you this morning, Lord. Lord, we come trusting you. Trust in that you know what to do with those best, much better than we do. So we leave them in your care. And Jesus, our Sabbath rest, we fall into your embrace this morning. And we simply rest. Help us, Lord. Give us that peace that passes understanding. And help us to take advantage of that wonderful rest that you offer to us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this great gift of Sabbath to mankind. Help us as we avail ourselves of this blessing. For Jesus, we now ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen.
that he is enough, right? We come with all these worries and cares and concerns. And as I said, sometimes we want to take them back. It's almost like we feel like Jesus isn't enough. But yes. And so come unto Jesus. He is enough. Well, enough preaching, right? Let's move on. Today is Potluck Sunday, so I encourage you to join us for that right downstairs uh, for what time of wonderful fellowship uh, together. Our prayer minister today is, is Art, Art Forbes, uh, and he'll be up here at the front, and he'll be more than happy to pray for any cares and concerns or needs that you have. Just a reminder to all of our prayer ministers. Firstly, I just want to say thank you. We have a different prayer minister up here every week, just help, just willing to pray for any needs and cares and concerns that we have. Thank you. 
It's a wonderful ministry. I thank you for that. But just a reminder, we have a prayer minister meeting straight after this. Go downstairs, get your, your plate of, of food, and then join us up up the top. And uh, we're just going to have just a quick meeting uh, talking about the prayer uh, minister's ministry. Uh, so join me up in the church office uh, straight after this. A reminder, we have our men's breakfast this coming uh, Thursday. So if you, if, guys, if you could just give us a show of hands uh, if you're able to make it. That's Thursday, 8.30, right here at the church. Uh, if you're able to make it, it'd be fantastic. There's probably some others who are not here this morning as well. Uh, does it give you enough of a head count? All right, uh, so join us for that. That should be fantastic. Uh, ladies, you've also got your turn coming up. Uh, uh, what's it called here? Peace, popcorn, and pretzels. Wow, the guys don't get any fancy names like that, do we? We're, we're just the men's breakfast. <laughs> they get peace, popcorn, and pretzels. Last week it was hugs and mugs and something else, right? <laughs> the, we're going to have pretzels and beer. We're going <laughs> to, all right. <laughs> so that's going to be at Kathy's home, and that's uh, February the 13th. It's 10 o'clock, is it? Yeah, 10 o'clock. So uh, we've got a church app. If you can sign up on there, or there's a link on the Friday newsletter. Uh, you can click on that um, and just give Kathy an idea of how many people are going to be coming to her home. I'm sure she'll appreciate that. Well, I'm excited. Uh, next Sunday is Baptism Sunday. I know some of you are saying, again. Uh, <laughs> but God is good. God is good. And we're excited that he's uh, bringing people into his house and that uh, people are following through in obedience with baptism. So I'm excited. Uh, Sherry is, is going to be baptized. If anyone else feels the call to be baptized, uh, come and speak to me or just sign up on our church app. Uh, right? uh, I'm very willing to dunk you, I promise. <laughs> So, uh, but Baptism Sunday next next week. Uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, bless you, Sherry, for just going through that step of obedience. Uh, February the 11th, the week after that is our church annual meeting. Just a reminder about that. So that's straight after the worship service. And again, Don and Kathy, we thank you for serving both of you as elders here for, for two terms now. And what a blessing both of you ha have been as you have helped shape the ministry at GCC. And uh, we're excited to uh, present two prospective elder candidates, Art Forbes and Becky Isley, and just keep them in your prayers. Members, you have a chance to, to vote for them. Uh, you can do that through the church app under events. You can do that through the e-newsletter link on, that comes out on Friday, or you can just vote in person uh, at, the, at the annual uh, meeting. So that's coming up on Feb February the 11th. And one more thing, we have a membership class coming up. We have now four people coming uh, into membership, taking that class. Uh, that's going to be February the 25th. If anyone else is interested in church membership, uh, we have four requirements for, for membership. Uh, one is a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Secondly, we have baptism. Third is taking the membership class. And then fourth is just signing the, our faith statement that you, uh, you, you uh, believe that you're willing to abide and believe uh, what this church holds uh, precious. So, uh, so that membership class is coming up on the 25th. And Mike, you have an announcement? One more. Mike, Mike gets the last word. <laughs> oh, he does that, eh? <laughs> Catches me unaware. Hey, just a real quick one, since I haven't been up here and I want to remind you. Basically, we're up to 47 boxes in that pile. Fantastic. It's about six wow. feet tall and in the back I've built some pallets that will take them. Um, I've got seven more and I probably have enough stuff to do it. So we'll get up to 54. There'll be three pallets of 18 each trying to ship in the middle of the month. So uh, I want to thank the folks who have helped me. Uh, Renee has probably vacuum packed more stuff than she ever thought she would. <laughs> and I know I've had help from like Dennis and, and Art and uh, uh, Nan and others have come over to help vacuum pack at my house on occasion. And so going forward, I'm going to probably tap into guys with the macho guys in the church that have big trucks to haul all this stuff. Because it goes to Safeway, and then we build the pallets, and I, they, they take care of them inside until the guy with the truck can come get them, because I don't have a loading dock in my garage. I should, and so but Mike, I don't. Just before you go, can you tell us what's in all those boxes? These are on the way okay. to Ukraine, by the way. Uh, for, for there's a pretty good mixture. Uh, I can't tell you which boxes are in, but there's a, a lot of clothes, a lot of clothes, and a lot of kid clothes. I think I probably have 60 or 70 onesies in there. I mean, a lot of people seem to have onesies at home. And of course, my wife said, what do they need onesies for? The guys are all in war. And I said, don't you remember when I came back from Vietnam, what happened? <laughs> we needed onesies in about nine months. <laughs> 
So anyway, there's that. I had some people gave us some amazing brand new Carhartt coats, heavy duty coats, winter clothing of all kinds, lots of blankets. Uh, there's a, uh, dishes to help uh, stock this house, not only to clothe the kids, but to feed them and everything else. Uh, toys, school supplies. Um, if I got my hands on it, it got put in a box. So, um, and most of it came from you guys, but I got to tell you, we got stuff from a church in Boise. A Mormon church sent me five boxes full of stuff. I got stuff from uh, Serenity House. They have a couple more boxes I need to pick up Monday. Um, we got stuff from people that, I, that don't go to our church. They just contacted us because we stuck it on next door, and I just pick it up at their houses. So it's been a pretty broad support we've had, but mostly it's uh, you guys, so a lot of stuff. So thank you. Yeah, well, let's just give Mike a hand, and, and everybody everybody that has helped. And as, as Mike said, we've had a lot of community involvement, people coming, even dropping off uh, clothes and all kinds of goodies here at the church as well. It's been fantastic. And this, of course, is our second shipment over to the Ukraine. So what a blessing. Thank you, Mike, uh, for uh, heading up that uh, initiative there. Well, friends, let's now bow for the benediction, shall we? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face and indeed his smile toward you. And friends, may the Lord give you his peace. Go in his grace. Go in the joy of the Lord. Go in the anointing of his spirit. And friends, go to serve the Lord. God bless you. Amen.